Why did I give you chosen? It's a service for. I think there's a message behind that. <laughs> systems really span. So um, up to the kilogram regime and, um, and this whole frequency range here. I mean, that's, I, I, I really find that a, a very fascinating feature because you can pick your system and it can uh, basically jump orders of magnitude around in different um, parameters with essentially one and the same coupling mechanism. So um, I, I, I picked out like three or four um, applications of optomechanical systems that I just find um, very interesting and neat, and you should have at least heard about that. And then we go on. So here's one that comes out of Hong Tang's lab a um, couple of years ago now already. Um, the, the main idea is to basically build sort of a nanomechanical memory cell. And uh, they, they, they start off with a, a bistable mechanical system. You see you can have the sort of a buckling instability. You can have two um, mechanically uh, different uh, um, positions. You have this um, interferometer, interferometer here, this um, um, race track for, for photons, essentially a little cavity. And what you can do now is uh, basically um, you can read out the state in which the mechanical system is, the upstate or down state, because this actually um, affects your cavity frequency. So you just read out the cavity frequency. But you can also now um, essentially um, bring the system up here, right? basically release it from one, from one of its um, stable um, um, positions in double well potential, uh, ramp it up, and then deliberately cool it back down with optomechanical actions into one of the two minima. Right? And in that way, you can actually then write or so zeros and ones. So it's a read-write um, nanomechanical um, memory cell that's really just operated uh, by by light. So that's quite nice. Um, what else do we have? Ah, yeah. Uh, Clemens told you about the um, the optomechanical induced transparency, essentially an interference effect between um, photons scattered off the mechanics and photons being um, transmitted. Um, through a cavity. So basically, you have a, a photon that is scattered from an off resonant driving beam that interferes with the photon that uh, is resonant with the cavity. And then you can have um, destructive interference, and that can lead actually to a dip um, in the transmission of the cavity. So that's a, um, uh, it's the analog, this is the optomechanical analog of electromagnetic induced transparency that you have in atomic vapors, for example. Now, what does that mean? Um, that actually means that you can um, modify the dispersion relation of the cavity. That's the interesting part of it. Right? So you can, um, having the dip here, so you can, you can um, change the curvature, and um, once you have a modified dispersion relation, of course, you can start to engineer group velocities and so on. So if you are now clever enough and um, build up a whole array of such, um, of such cavities, um, you can actually really have an optical pulse, for example, send it through the array of cavities and using this um, dispersion engineering, basically slow down the pulse, um, store it, and release it again. So that is a really interesting platform for on-chip, um, uh, purely optomechanical uh, memory cells, so for quantum memory, for optical, optical storage um, of, of light. And basically here, I think the two um, leading groups that have pushed that were um, Oscar's group, Oscar Painter's group, and PBS Kippenberg's group. And now we also, there are many experiments also in the electromechanical domain microwaves. Um, this, Clemens has already mentioned that, that is becoming big these days. So this is um, something um, that 
is an outstanding challenge, in particularly in quantum information science, um, to bridge this domain between optical photons and microwave photons. I mean, in the classical world, this is something you do on an everyday basis in the lab. Right? You have a you have you have you have a bifurcated crystal. Um, you um, apply um, a voltage between the between the two two phases of the crystal. So you modulate the uh, index of refraction uh, with some um, RF or microwave field, uh, which means when you send a laser light through, that you generate sidebands on your laser light, and this is what Keith essentially um, showed you in his talk. And, and this, this you can say is a sort of um, RF or microwave to optics transversion. And so you, you take um, energy in the electromagnetic field and uh, generate sidebands in the optic. But the question is, can you do that also on a single photon level? So can you actually come up with a um, single microwave photon, say, um, and um, convert that to a single photon in the optical domain? Right? So basically, as a single photon in a sideband of an optical carrier, for example. Right? And then, for example, then, then, then use that, send it from, I don't know, Berkeley to Caltech, so from one fridge to the other, and then go back again into a microwave circuit. So basically interconnect now the local solid state qubits, microwave qubits, through optical um, lines. Okay? But for that you need, a, um, you need an efficient conversion. And uh, no, Clemens showed, that, uh, Clemens showed you um, uh, Cleland's experiment already, and there are a couple of groups that now um, essentially try to uh, work at that interface. So for example, have um, such an optomechanical uh, crystal where you, um, uh, where you, through the piezoelectric effect, couple to the electromagnetic fields. Um, but at the same time, um, you basically do have an optomechanical interaction because now, of course, the strain fields of the cavity then um, couple us to the optical field. And you can write now the, um, the, the, the um, information of the microwave um, of, the, of, the, of the microwave field onto the optical field. Um, so the challenges right now are essentially that it's extremely hard to have um, piezoelectric materials um, operating um, how to say, with low absorption, low losses in the optical domain. So uh, what people have started out with, out with here is aluminum nitride, for example, engineer that. They have relatively large absorption. Um, also a problem is, uh, even if you have low absorption in the beginning, um, you want to operate that at 20 millikelvin. If you have a solid state system, operate at 20 millikelvin, you send light in, optical photons, um, well, absorption is really uh, a killer there. So this is a, it's, it's, it's still not really clear, uh, I think, right now. Um, how to how to overcome that? There are certain ideas to do that in a pulse regime and so on. But this is a um, predominantly right now material science challenge. But maybe also a challenge for coming up with interesting protocols how to um, how to match those two domains. Yeah. Okay. There was also quite a quite nice um, OSIS group um, some time ago. They basically um, made a accelerometer. So here is a huge mass. Um, as an inertial mass, and the reader of the mass is done here from this optomechanical zipper cavity. And the nice thing is, you can now, apart from the from the good readout sensitivity that you have, um, you can actually tune the optomechanics here the, the spring constant of the system. Uh, spring constant of the system. So it's a very nice integrated um, system. Um, okay. La last one. This is this is one from um, from our lab, and that came as a surprise, and is um, still. Um, uh, we are still working on that. Um, so this you already know. This is LIGO. Uh, this is um, a uh, optical clock, essentially, so an optical local oscillator for an atomic clock system uh, by the Chile and NIST. They, together with PDB, used that to build the world's most stable uh, optical clock a couple of years ago. And what those two systems have in common is first of all they are based on optical cavities and they are limited these days, so the best performance these days is limited by something that is called the coating thermal noise. And let me just briefly go into that. 
So, um, uh, I, I, I first show the physics and then come back to this graph. Uh, so what is the idea? If you have, if you have an optical cavity, you basically have two mirrors facing each other. Okay? And um, the point is that uh, in the ideal world, uh, you basically have here you have a power build up and um, you do not have any distortion of your electromagnetic field and therefore you get um, an inf uh, infinite resonant enhancement and therefore um, infinite Q of this cavity. Real life um, looks different. Um, in real life, um, you do have, first of all, corrugation, so you have scattering losses, but um, you also have thermal motion. So the point is that um, the Brownian motion of these, of these systems here, of the mirrors, um, induce um, phase noise. So for each round trip, um, you get a phase noise, and that simply accumulates, that ties up. And then after, um, after a couple of round trips, you basically end up with a um, with a phase noise limited performance of your of your local oscillator. Okay. And uh, essentially, if you think about um, if you think about where this comes from, what the limit is, it's simply thermally driven displacement fluctuations. Right? It's a mechanical issue, actually. Um, and the, 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 the limit is basically, uh, so this is an instance of the fluctuation dissipation theory. So whenever you have um, dissipation and fluctuation. So the more dissipation you have in the system, the more fluctuations you have. So one way to understand that um, is uh, if you basically, if you look at the, 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 the mode spectrum um, of, the, um, of the mechanical modes of your, of your surface, um, then if you have a very, la uh, if you have a very large uh, quality factor, all of the energy is going to is, is piled up here at, um, at your resonances, and uh, basically the overall noise that accumulates here at low frequencies, which is a relevant time scale for such cavities, because you um, average over a long time, gets down. If um, the, the quality factor is bad, all the noise um, in the system get, gets actually uh, piles up at low frequencies, and if you if you sum over all the modes. Um, then what you get is your typical um, 1 over f noise, and that scales then with the damping of your system. Okay? So this is, is essentially the fluctuation dissipation. Uh, so main message is you cannot avoid that. Okay? There's no there's no way around it. The only way around it is to set the temperature to zero. Okay? Because then <laughs> uh, then there's nothing to, to fluctuate anymore. Mm, and if you look now at the at the current performance of these, um, here, um, this is the advanced LIGO noise budget. Mm, you can see um, basically the black one is the total noise in the system, and um, the minimum in the, uh, in the so the optimum in the performance is essentially limited by those two curves. This um, purple one is the standard quantum limit, um, and the red one here is actually the coating. Brownian noise, so the thermal noise of the code. And that means that the performance of advanced LIGO, so of this four kilometer long uh, interferometer, is limited by a six micron thick optical coating at the end of the test process. Okay. This is the limit for the current, yes. In, in so, the, so, so why is it the coating and not the, the, not the entire mirror? Um, so nothing to right. Uh, this is actually the answer Keith has given uh, yesterday already. The answer is that the mechanical quality um, of the substrate has been engineered or chosen already such that um, this completely drops out. So you can see that here in the lower one. So you have to, you're fully correct. So, so this is the performance of this 40 millihertz um, stable, um, stable laser by the, 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 the chiller guys in PTB. Um, so this is a single crystal silicon cavity and you have three contributions to the noise. You have um, the spacer, so the, the single crystal um, spacer contribution to the noise, you have the substrate where the coating is put on, and you have, and you have the coating itself. Okay? And for all of these three, they actually have mechanical modes. Okay? And um, so basically, well, look, here's a study of um, the different combinations. So the um, ULE um, spacer and ULE substrate. Okay? You see in that case, um, this ultra low expansion material has extremely bad mechanical quality compared to other systems so that the, the noise is dominated by the substrate. Um, if you go to fused silica for the substrate um, and, the, and, the, for, and, and 
um, ULE for the spacer, um, you see that you kill the, the two contributions from substrate and spacer, mm -hmm. and you're limited by the code. And eventually, if you go to the silicon silicon cavity, it is the one that has been built. Um, there's only the, the coating contribution. Yes? Does the spacer not contributing have anything to do with that letter you showed with Schrodinger and the giant mirror and saying that the mirror is too heavy? You did the back of the envelope calculation and you said it wasn't really contributing to the photon no. bounces off. No, no. Um, because in that case, what we are talking about is really thermally induced um, displacement. That is much, much larger than the displacement through a single photon hitting the, hitting the mirror. Um, okay, so now, well, what does this have to do with optomechanics? In the end, it's an optomechanical property of the system. No? So um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a property of the, of the code. And I, I told you before, uh, I told you yesterday, we started to do in the, in the very beginning. So when we started to work with Keith, we started out with trying to do these um, silica tantal pentoxide coatings, which is right now the best available optical coatings, and try to um, make micromechanical systems just out of the coatings. And we discovered that the mechanical Q is always around 3000 and will never get better, no matter what you do, no matter how you shape it, it's completely shape independent. Q is 3000, you, you don't, don't get better. Um, and then we fabricated uh, these mechanical resonators out of gas L gas, correctly plane. So this is what you see here. And the Q suddenly skyrocketed, very high Q. Um, so, two things. First of all, um, the underlying reason is essentially that um, in these silica tantal coatings, um, you have very many defects simply. So, the way these materials are produced is they are iron being sputtered onto some substrate, and this is the most brutal method you can imagine for a material. It's very densely put on there, it's, 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 it's amorphous, lots of defects, and so on, um, through the process. So this is where all the, um, all the strain energy, the mechanical energy, can actually go into. That's a highly dissipative system. In the epitaxially grown L gas layers, they are, have intrinsically lower defects. I mean, you still have um, the two-level systems and so on that we heard about, um, but they are much, much um, smaller in density. So the defect density is much, much smaller than in these amorphous coatings. And that's why you can sort of intuitively explain why the mechanical quality is so much better in these materials. Um, independently, at that time, I started to read the papers of the gradational wave community. So this was, of course, always after we did the experiments. And, <laughs> and in the gradational wave community, they talk about the coding loss angle. Because what they, they actually realized already around 2000 that they are limited in the performance um, through the coding. And they say, oh, this is this coding loss angle, and they had ways to measure it, and so on. Um, and it turns out the coating loss angle is because, uh, so due to the fluctuation dissipation relation, simply the inverse of the mechanical quality. So I took the, I, I took the data from the gradation wave community that, uh, that said that, oh, you know, your loss angle is um, always going to be larger than 5 times 7 minus 4. You invert that, Q 3000. Okay, uh, 2000. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I remember finding those papers and just, re just realizing that was a real high point in my scholarship. It's <laughs> <laughs> been a year or two. Now, at the same time, so here, here comes the upside of that, right? So first of all, it tells you, um, yeah. <laughs> why, why, why spend half an hour in the library when you can spend a year in the lab finding things out for yourself? <laughs> Uh, the, the, the other thing was, of course, now we realized, well, but what does it mean if you turn things around? Now we do have um, a, um, a coating with extremely low loss angle. So does that mean that if we were able to not fabricate mechanical systems, but actually take this thing, make it bigger, uh, and use it as a coating on some other substrate, an optical coating, wouldn't that get rid of the coating thermal noise issue for those, um, for those cavity guys, right? And so I remember in 2008 there was a coating workshop with LIGO. This is where we basically first had the results and more or less I, 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 was, I was pitching to them. I said, oh, wouldn't that be interesting? And by the way, this would be a nice way of measuring your, your coating loss angle without any additional assumptions. Just make a mechanical resonator out of your coating and measure it. Um, 
And then, well, one could maybe make a coating also and so on. So the reaction was, um, well, first of all, uh, no, we, we already thought about that 20 years ago. Um, didn't work back then, not gonna work now. Uh, first of all, you will never be able to um, basically put a semiconductor single crystal coating on a curved surface, and then the losses of the interface will be so high that this whole effect is gone. Okay? Well, so uh, this was our internal fuck you project. <laughs> so we, we, did it, we did it nevertheless. And it turns out you can do it. Um, it turns out you can actually now um, grow your um, single crystal coating on top of uh, top of gallium arsenide, for example. So you have to grow it on a single crystal wafer. Uh, of course, otherwise you lose, uh, because you need every text. You need lattice match and so on for the, the growth. Um, a substrate, then you can remove it from the substrate. Basically, you have a, you have a freestanding disc now of a centimeter, so like six micron thick um, uh, uh, gas, L gas, rack coating. And that you can now bond onto a curved substrate. Right, so onto a curved glass substrate, for example. Then you can put it on a spacer, build a cavity out of that, right? And so uh, the first cavity that we did um, had a finesse of 150,000, so that was quite good. And then together with uh, the group of Juni and Chiller, we compared now the performance of this cavity with their best, um, uh, with their best optical cavity that they had. So this is the, the local oscillator um, for the strontium that is called. And from the data that we got, so we basically compared the noise um, performance of these two cavities, and from that data we actually inferred um, the amount of uh, coating thermal noise in the system. And lo and behold, we basically reconstructed and demonstrated that we really get a tenfold decrease um, according to the mechanical quality factor improvement of our coating. So this was really um, that on the, directly on the, the, the prediction uh, for the ideal case. So what does that mean now? Um, that means if you would take the LIGO, um, if you would take the LIGO uh, system, you basically push this red curve down to such an extent that it does not limit anymore your performance. So then you're only limited by, by the quantum limit, and then you can use squeeze light, for example, to basically um, improve further the sensitivity. Uh, as long as you have this thing here, squeezing simply doesn't help, because you, you bump into this limit of, uh, of classical noise. So uh, we are looking into that right now. So we have a collaboration with the guys in Hanover at the, um, at the, the, the German uh, gravitational wave facility. So we have now made, as you see, this is 10 centimeters. So we have now made a 10 centimeter large um, uh, semiconductor single crystal coating on top of, of silica. And uh, now the next step is to put that on some prototype substrate for a gravitational wave um, prototype. So that's fun. <laughs> so how, how big do you need them to be? Yeah. So right now the 10 meter prototype in Hanover is um, is four centimeters, I think. And the advanced LIGO optics, Nancy, help me out. I think the advanced LIGO optics is like 20 centimeters or so. Right. Diameter. Yeah, diameter. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So have you? Have you have you managed to grow a single crystal on 20 centimeters? Uh, it's possible. Yes. So right now, the um, I think right now the standard sizes for the epitaxial growth facilities for the semiconductor industry are six inch. Which is times two and a half. Yes, it's times two and a half. It's like fifteen centimeters. So that's already it's already close. Mm -hmm. And I think they're still debating on the size of the diameter in the advanced LIGO design. Uh, oh, and the LIGO 3G, sorry. Oh, yeah, 3G, yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. For the A LIGO, right? So a LIGO that's yeah, working yeah, right now is 20 cents. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. And uh, by the way, that, that it's also interesting now to, to see where, where, where this one goes, right? So we are also now um, we are collaborating with the NIST guys on replacing in their cavity the coatings with our coatings and uh, basically uh, get rid of this. Rest noise. So, Marcus, I have a question. Actually, mm -hmm. When you measure the uh, noises of these two cavities, or if you only have one cavity, how do you make sure it's coding thermal noise and not another noise? Yeah. Um, so, basically, so in that case, um, here you deliberately design the cavity in such a way that um, coding thermal noise dominates, so you make it small. I mean, one way to actually minimize coding thermal noise is to make the cavity very long. 
right? because the, the, the fluctuations, if the frequency fluctuation in the cavity scale um, with, with, with one over the length, right? so the relative frequency fluctuation is, um, is delta omega over omega is equivalent to delta L over L. So if you make a long cavity, you can actually suppress the, the, the effect of the displacement fluctuations of, this, of, the, of the cavity. The, the problem is, um, you can do that, and once you go to half a meter or so of a cavity, then you start to be fine. But try to stabilize um, a half meter cavity. And this is a, this is, this is a, this is, um, this huge block of material um, that is fluctuating, so acoustic noise entering, entering the cavity is a real pain. There's right now, there's P. Schmidt's group in, in, in Braunschweig. They have mastered to do a half meter cavity, but it's a huge pain in there. So this is, um, this is the art in itself. <coughs> the, the message here is, you need, to, you need them to be like, using a spacer and not suspended. Exactly, yes, yes. You, need to, you need a spacer, otherwise yeah. you have to do that. And, and the message here is with this tenfold, uh, if, you, if you just take a tenfold improvement, this is like just what we have right now, um, you can build um, a cavity with the same performance than the, than the half meter cavity and shrink the size down by a factor of 10. Okay? And, get, and still get the same performance. And that now improves your, improves your stability. Um, and, and so on. Yeah, as it turns out, in practically, if you, if you, if you look where, where then um, those uh, optic clocks and so on are limited, uh, it's much more than, uh, than just this noise source of the, the coating thermal noise. Right? So it's also practical limitations in the feedback loop and so on. And the more stable you can build your system, the less noise you have in the feedback loop again, and then, yeah, so it goes on. <laughs> the story. So, in, in this uh, noise spectrum, which one is without the coding? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. So, um, so this is just, this is inferred uh, this is inferred contribution of the um, of the um, of, of the coding. And what you have here is the um, the red one. The red one is for the silica tantala coding, so that the, the standard ones. And um, it's Brownian plus thermo optic. Thermo optic I didn't talk about. Uh, basically, you can have also dissipation not only through mechanics, but you can also have dissipation through um, just um, uh, um, optic losses in the material. Then you have thermo optic effects. Um, the nice thing about thermo optic effects is there are two contributions, and you can cancel them if you engineer the coating correctly. So, in a sense, they are still there in the standard coating designs, but uh, you can have coating designs where the thermo optic contribution is just gone. Um, the, here, the, 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 this greenish yellowish one um, is the Brownian noise just of the algas code. Okay? Um, because the noise is so low, the, the, the thermo optic contribution in that case was large. So basically, at larger frequencies, the thermo was dominated by thermo optic noise. But again, so we have, right now we have, a, we have a project with Rana Adhikari at Caltech. And um, it's quite clear that we can cancel that, that contribution and then really go all the way down also at larger frequencies. Yeah. Right. Okay, so so much for the practical part. <laughs> and maybe one, one last thing. So the factor of 10 uh, without the historic context might, might tell you nothing because the last, so but at the point LIGO discovered that this was the limit, also the, the, the the clock people, atomic clock people discovered this was the limit. They of course started looking into that. And you have um, a 15 year history of people trying to optimize those coatings and, um, and, and, and minimize this coating loss angle. The best they got, and this was one data point out of, um, um, out of many attempts, was a factor of two improvement um, of what we have now. And so basically, there is, there is currently, there is there's no known alternative how to um, how to improve on the, on the standard uh, coatings. Now that you guys have, have realized this, do you understand what they uh, saw 20 years ago that then led them to reject this idea? Was, um, was the MIDI E not as good? Is, um, the, is the camera still on? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I insist on some parts not being, not being on the internet. Because <laughs> otherwise I, can, I, can, I cannot answer that. <laughs> well, so frankly, um, 
Well, we can do it good. Yeah, exactly. Beep, 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 beep. <laughs> and, and you know, and then this whoop said, <laughs> and this fun. <laughs> do, you me, do you want me to stop it? Um, frankly, they never try. They never try. No, they never try. And um, I, I, I think one has to, has to give credit to a couple of the, of the old guys there who went even thought about that, and I think there's also something in literature. But um, in, the, the main point was that um, people thought the optical absorption of those materials is too large. Uh -huh. Because what you want um, for, for those experiments, so both in, the, um, both for, in, in, in those domains, you want ultra-low optical losses, really have high finesse carities, you, you have, your, your optic losses have to be in the parts per million regime. Right? So 1 out of 10 to the 6 photons um, uh, should only be absorbed. And if you just look in the uh, standard literature, so people when they measure bulk, um, uh, bulk, bulk absorption um, lengths for, for L gas, you would expect something like 100 ppm, 500 ppm and so on. And that's also what we saw in the very beginning. We had MOCVD ground samples, absorption was like 500 ppm and so on. <laughs> um, we are now down at a single digit PPM level. Mm -hmm. right, so we can, and, and the, um, the, 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 the sort of solution is really ultra high pure MBE. Right, so you can have uh, MBE growth with little add atoms that basically minimize the absorption. And we are now almost at the same level than the, the silica tender coatings, which we also wouldn't have thought that it is possible. And then the next thing was they thought, um, oh, if you now bond that here on the interface, um, we will basically have mechanical losses at the interface, and that's going to kill it. So this was the second argument after the absorption, and the fact that you cannot transfer it. Right? And that also turned out to be not true. So I guess for the fact that this is really a nice chemical bond. It's a covalent bond that you create. Right? It's just this it's bond. There is, no, um, there, is no, there is no interface really. Is it? Is it sorry. Is it possible that in future, if we do get even better coatings than our gas, uh, then that chemical bonding uh, will show some thermaloids? Or you're that saying that there is, so I'm saying that are there two contributions from uh, one from our gas and the other from the bonding, mm -hmm. uh, and the bonding is just sitting much lower and you don't see it, or is it oh, I see. Well. Okay, I mean, this is now a question about the error bar of the measurement, right? I mean, we expect that approximately a factor of 10 through the Q mechanical quality, we got approximately a factor of 10. Um, yeah. So, do you just, are you able just to set this film coating onto this uh, substrate and just fix? Is it, or do you have to do any other tricks? Is no. it just surface area? And it's yeah, that's it. It's just mm -hmm. optical contacting. Yeah. I mean, you do sort of um, uh, anneal it a little bit to basically uh, heal out of the bonds, to increase the bond strength. Mm -hmm. But something that we're studying right now, the bond strength as a function of all the different tricks we do, and uh, it's working progress. I think this is where it comes in. So it might, if the bond strength is not good, then that means that you have a problem, right? Because, um, yeah. So, that, yeah, so that there will be a contribution scales with the bond strength. Okay. Yeah. Hopefully, exponential. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, done? Is that good? Can we, can we switch gears? Ooh. <laughs> okay, so that, that was my tiny part about um, applications. So, gravity. Um, so, uh, quantum and gravity. So these are, let's say, quantum physics and gravity. These are two communities that's always, um, always fun to watch. There are many, Many, many interesting uh, stories. Um, so I just give you one example why these two communities, these two communities, so quantum foundations and gravitational research, really have a lot in common. So again, a couple of quotes. Bryce David, he wrote, I think, a paper not, not that long ago, um, <coughs> where he sort of recalls the history of gravitational research. Okay. So most of you can have no idea how hostile the physics community was in those days. So we are talking here about the, the, the early 50s, early 1950s. Okay? Uh, how hostile the physics community was in those days to persons who studied general relativity. It was worse than the hostility emanating from some quarters today toward the string theory community. <laughs> in the mid-50s, Sam Goudsmith, a famous physicist, um, then editor-in-chief of the FISREF, 
let it be known that an editorial would soon appear saying that the physical review and physical review letters would not longer it would no longer accept papers on gravitation or other fundamental theory. That this editorial did not appear was due to the behind the scenes effort of John Wheeler. Yeah. Um, and there are many interesting um, I, I told you yesterday about this um, Chapel Hill conference in 19, 1957. So this was uh, one of the reasons that they started this conference, that they um, to basically reinstate uh, gravitational research as something that is taken seriously. It seems that one of the main problems at this time was um, that the papers that were submitted to um, to to, to this ref were essentially papers from people saying, "Oh, if you look at the field equations now, this is how you get anti-gravity and so on." So basically, all the basic stuff had already been covered. Um, the, the first 10 years after, um, after, after, after general relativity was established. And now the next 20 years, um, people just tr trying to find out new things that were not in the field. Right? And this was more or less, yeah. Must, would, would be interesting to see in the archives what type of papers they got. But it must have been really bad. <laughs> Otherwise, you, you, you wouldn't take such, such measures, I guess. Well, you know, Fisra Measures also decided not to accept any more papers on masers. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so there was no behind the scene effort. Eh? So <laughs> That's why the first laser paper was rejected, because it was an optical laser. Oh, I see. So they had to come up with a new name. That's good. So, yeah. <laughs> it's just incremental work. Yeah. <laughs> um, so when I read that, that reminded me of some of the of some of the famous quotes that you read in the quantum foundations literature, right? So for example, um, uh, you would say um, the guy who basically started the foundations of decoherence theory, right? He writes in his memoirs it was absolutely impossible at that time, so it's the 70s now, to discuss these ideas now, maybe 60s, to discuss these ideas with colleagues or even publish them. An influential Heidelberg Nobel Prize winner frankly informed me that any further activities on this subject would end my academic <laughs> career. Right. And then, he's, then, he, then he figured, he writes on, he figured, well, um, uh, since I already have made such a bad impact, my career is, uh, is, is gone already, so I can also just continue working on it. <laughs> well, that's what he did. Um, well, there are other stories about John, John Clauser, for example. Right? Never, um, I mean, one of the leading um, figures in the foundation of quantum theory never got a um, permanent position back then, right, at the, at the, at the institution. Because, right, it was denied no, tenure. Or, say again? Denied tenure. Exactly, it was denied tenure. tenure. <coughs> Not interesting physics. And then, of course, there's this famous quote um, that um, John Bell, um, the question that John Bell asked Alain Spee when he went to, uh, to CERN to see him and uh, ask him what he thinks about doing a bad experiment. Then the first question that John Bell raised was, well, do you have a permanent position? <laughs> Which, fortunately, in the French system, he did. Right? No, so he the French system, he was a student. Yeah, yeah, but he was an ENS student. So right. an ENS student means that you basically have a permanent right. contract. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, the French system has some advantages. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so. Well, Gravity. So this I already showed you, um, and I already made the point that um, if you think about mechanical um, resonators, then the fact that you can have now in the micromechanical domain small masses, large quality factors, um, then with a decent integration time, you can um, start to measure extremely small forces. Then let me give you one example. So this is actually uh, one of the things that. Um, I want to do, we are designing currently an experiment to do that, um, but it's, uh, well, it's in a design phase, but let me just throw the idea out here and um, get you <coughs> on that. So let's, let's take the following um, situation. So here now our harmonic oscillator is just some mass loaded cantilever, for example, or a mass sitting in, a, um, sitting in an optical trap or magnetic trap and so on. Um, if you do the calculations, let, let, let's take a cantilever the frequency, you can get down to 100 hertz or so. Um, if you take a sphere, now in that case, let's say the sphere has a, has a radius of a millimeter, and it's, it's a lead sphere, the quality factor is on the order of 10 to the 5, that sounds reasonable, that you can achieve that with a mass-loaded cantilever at 100 hertz. Um, and it's a room temperature experiment. 
Okay? And what do you do? You take a sphere of the same size, okay, and just place it um, a couple of millimeters next to it. Okay? And then, neglecting now any sort of mechanical coupling, so this needs to be designed in a good way, um, you start to basically uh, modify the amplitude of the system. Okay? Through gravitational coupling, you should be able to ring up the motion of this um, of this of the system. Because if you look at if you look at the, 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 the force noises here, so the thermal force noise of that system, I already gave you the numbers yesterday. Yesterday I, had a, I chose a Q factor of 10 to the 10. Now we have 10 to the 5. So this is why uh, the force noise is now down to 10 to the minus 16 newton, or 10 to the minus 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 15 newton. Um, the displacement noise is on the order of 10 nanometer per root hertz. So that sort of gives you also a level below which you have to um, stabilize the, the ground floor of your, of your lab, which is not difficult at all. Uh, so these numbers. And um, the gravitational force, in contrast, is uh, an order of magnitude um, larger. Right? Well, in, that, in that case, it's a factor of five. Okay. So that means you should be able to actually um, measure the gravitational force of um, uh, Two millimeter diameter uh, lead sphere. Uh, just by What is small d? What is small d? Where is small d? In the gravitational force. Gravitational force. Oh, that's the distance. Uh, the distance um, between, in that case, I think the distance between the surface. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but now, now, of course. First question comes to mind, uh, what about all the other forces? Okay, I mean, that's nice, but that's the ideal situation of um, the world exists only of gravity. Okay, so let's look at the other forces. So um, here's another case, the uh, first situation with silica spheres, so less dense, so it means the force is a little smaller. Radius um, of two millimeter in that case, and the driving amplitude that um, is set to epsilon. Epsilon is the distance of the, between the two surfaces divided by 10. So that's, we just take that as the driving point. And then you can calculate um, what, is the, what is the force just due to gravitational interaction. And you do that as a function of epsilon. So while you increase epsilon, um, you, basically, um, you basically see that this is the contribution of the gravitational force in, um, uh, with respect to displacement of the mechanical system. Right. It has this funny shape because you see, as you increase epsilon, you also increase the drive amplitude, and that's why there's some optimal at some point. So it's just a, a funny way of talking. I'm just wondering um, how the gravitational field of Earth might affect the experiment order. Would it have an effect on these silica spheres? Well, in that case, uh, well, just turn it around, just do it like that, okay? And then the gravitational force just gives you a static displacement of the whole thing. Okay. okay. And then you do it Yeah. Um, what else do we have? Um, so, you know, you see Casimir, Van der Waals, uh, and so on. These are all forces that, this, this, these distances, I mean, here we are talking about, um, we are talking about millimeter level distances. These forces do not play a role. Yes? The difference between Casimir, Van der Waals, referring to how close the two yes. test masses will come yes. and, and experience around those forecasts? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thermal noise here. And uh, basically, so at the end, and, and ga gas is interesting because there's some, um, obviously, if you have some residual rest gas in there, then you would just get. Um, pressure waves uh, in the system, so you need to um, have a sufficiently small um, rest gas environment. And then, biggest question, Coulomb. Okay? Because normally, so th this is how you grow up, right? You get this, um, you get this idea implanted very early on, oh, um, if you uh, com compare the gravitational force uh, with the Coulomb force, that's um, 40 orders of magnitude, forget it, right? Well, but that's for an electron, <laughs> right? So this is comparing uh, gravitational force of an electron uh, and a Coulomb. But the point is, here we don't have an electron. Here we have 10 to the 20 atoms, okay? 
And um, if you compare now the gravitational force between two objects of 10 to the 20 atoms with Coulomb, let's say um, 200 charges that sit here um, on distributed on the sphere, on each of the spheres, okay, 200 charges, um, same or opposite, um, let's say in that case opposite, right, because we want to, um, uh, want to compare it to gravity, you can have up to 200 charges and still the effect is negligible. Right? Gravity will just dominate because there's so many atoms. So if you ramp up the number of atoms, gravity is going to be a dominant force. Yes? And is this 200 charges very easy to achieve? Like only sort of, only we have if you just have like sort of something Yeah, that's a good question at this size range, <laughs> actually. Um, so uh, if you do, if you just calculate how you, so how you would charge them, right? you charge them through some um, you know, uh, cosmic cosmic background uh, radiation that goes through, right? Um, I mean, once, once, once high energy hits these things, then you can charge them up a lot. Right? You can have also thousands of charges, um, but the probability of, um, of of hitting is extremely small. It, it, it starts to scale up with size. So, um, but uh, the estimates that we have for on the order of um, of millimeter size spheres is that um, charging shouldn't be a problem. And I mean, these are so large that you can you can always discharge them, right? These objects. I, I, so I don't see I don't see a reason why you shouldn't be able to get um, to just ground this whole experiment, right? And then as you don't have a problem to charge. Marcus, have you? Say again. If you would ground it, you could probably add a mechanical couple, right? Yeah, it's already touched. Yeah, exactly. It just has to be conducted. Mm -hmm. But the the <coughs> I mean, it looked. Just having I mean, just to say out there, the uh, so you've got a millimeter displacement of one cantilever, and you're looking for a femtometer on the other. Mm -hmm. So the vibration isolation between the two has to be extraordinarily good. Oh, no, it's not a millimeter. The, the displacement is like a hundred micron. Okay, so. but I'm, <coughs> yeah, but still, it's still, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. orders mm -hmm. So that's a challenge. But you know, people know how to make vibration isolation. Exactly. So the, the one part that uh, have you tried putting in the hash potential uh, that the ion trap people know that's on surfaces. And use that as a source of force between the two. No. <coughs> At that distances, do you think? I mean, if well, you're talking about small numbers, so who knows, right? Yeah. 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 I mean, of Kudo is, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. and, you know, they, they're ion trap. You know, people here know this more than I do, right? It's how, how close are the ions? To yeah, it's a good point. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, you, you modify the patch potentials, then you, you, you have room to play. It's just choosing the right material, coating on the material. Yeah, right. yeah but it's a good point. No, we haven't, we haven't done that. Yeah. I mean, I actually assumed that um, the, the size of the patch potentials um, are sufficiently small that uh, basically this is cool. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, okay. Well, you can have that. Well, you can have that. You can have that. It's got a few tiers that have no oxide, so it's got mm. a gold. Mm. Right, yeah. But that's what we do right now, actually. Yeah. So we work with gold at the moment. So we have little gold spheres of millimeters. Yeah. Right. So are you going to talk about the, the orange sum of Newton? Oh, so it's the sum of non-Newton. So this is, oh, yeah, so this, this, this is the sum of all those force contributions oh, that gotcha. are part Newtonian. And this is then where the, where the, where the signal to noise ratio is calculated from, just the ratio of those two curves. And it was for 100 hertz, you said? The, the vibration? Uh, exactly. So this was a, this is a 100 hertz oscillator. How hard is it to isolate 100 hertz? 100 hertz is still OK. It's still OK. Um, so it basically starts to, so 10 hertz is it's hell. Is hell. Yeah. 100 hertz, uh, this is where people already it's achieved. Purgatory. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like the seventh ring or something. <laughs> but do you think it's OK? I mean, you do have to take an effort. Yeah. Uh, there's no doubt about that. But but the numbers that we have, vibration isolation is if you add if you add one passive stage of vibration isolation, um, as people do in uh, um, in, in, in the, the either the STM or also the the, the old LIGO designs, the passive vibration <coughs> designs, then you should be fine. Uh, what what motivates the factor of ten in amplitude and uh, well, nothing. This was actually, this is just due to the fact that um, Jonas, who uh, basically, this is his PhD project, he's a super conservative person. So it's so his PhD to project to see the gravitational effect? Yes. <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs>
Wait a minute, you can calculate it, you can also see it. Right? <laughs> well, now we can publish the PRF. Yeah. When? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, and of course, so one of the first um, challenges is to start seeing um, thermal noise limitation of, um, of a small frequency oscillator, and this you have already seen nicely in Nancy's poster yesterday. So this is just old data that I took here. Um, that uh, basically is a, it's a project um, with, uh, with Nergis's group and Thomas Corbett's group. So um, Garrett Cole made these nice floppy candy levers, and um, what these guys are trying is essentially whether you can um, use these floppy candy levers to uh, see uh, back action noise at, at low frequencies. Right? Um, at the same time, of course. This requires to um, operate your interferometers at the thermal noise limit at these low frequencies. So this is now still uh, the kilohertz regime, but the, new, the latest data that you have seen actually in Nancy's poster yesterday, they really pushed it now down to the regime of a few hundred hertz. So that's um, beautiful um, first steps that are also um, essential then for our experiments. We have to see that. Okay? Okay, so once we have that, I would consider that to be so. Here, here are a couple of here are a couple of interesting aspects with such an experiment. Um, so, I mean, well, why are we doing that? <laughs> and all, besides, besides the fact that I, I just find it um, super cool to look at gravity between um, between between tiny uh, masses. Is that not a reason? Say again? Is that not, like, not a big enough reason? Oh yeah, sure. But uh, you know, I need a red line for the top, so I need to come up with another. <laughs> with another motivation to, to, to make you understand the next couple of slides. <laughs> um, <coughs> you can view that as um, a sort of top-down approach for our challenge that I put out in the very beginning, you know, Feynman's experiment, where you basically put a mass in a superposition and then couple it gravitationally to another mass. I mean, to, if you really want to take such an experiment serious, you need to show that you can have gravitational coupling between small objects. Because at the end of the day, it's, it, 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 will be, um, it will be small objects. Maybe centimeters, ideal case, right? It's the with helium. Um, but still, it, it will be it's a little bit small. Um, so hopefully, if that works with millimeter spheres, then you can start going down, going down in size. So where's the ultimate limit of that? And, um, could you, reach a, could you reach a size scale where you then, from the bottom up, have managed to generate quantum states? Um, secondly, as many of you might know, the gravitational constant is the least well-determined um, constant in nature, so four digits. Okay? So 100 ppm is right now the best measurement result. And um, most of these measurements are uh, conventional Cavendish type or Erdbosch type experiments. Recently, a new generation of um, atomic fountain experiments by, by Kasevich's group and by Tino's group um, managed to also get um, sensitivities for measuring qi down to the 10 to the minus 4 level. And there's hope maybe to really push that even further down with cold um, atom experiments. If you look in the literature where the for, for, this, for, 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 the, for, for, the, um, for the conventional mechanical experiments, where the limit in determining G comes from, um, it's very interesting. So basically, the two dominating, or the three dominating factors are density inhomogeneities in the, in the material, which then also leads to inaccuracies in the knowledge of the distance of the center of mass, on top of that thermal fluctuations, that also result in density fluctuations and therefore inaccuracies in the, in the determination of the distance to the center of mass, and thermal noise um, in, the, um, in, the, in the support of the mechanical system. Um, if you put all of that together and then ask yourself, so what about such a micromechanical experiment? Right? Spheres are small. Um, and you, can do, you, you can eventually maybe even have single crystalline uh, uh, objects. If they are of that size, millimeter, you could even think of doing full X-ray tomography and count the amount of defects if you really want to push it. Um, 
you could lithographically predefine maybe also structures, so you have a much better precision in your knowledge of the um, of the distances involved. Um, the thermal noise of the suspension you can completely cancel if you um, if you substitute such a mechanical oscillator by an optical trap or some some, some trap oscillator. Okay. So there is a there is a there is a chance. Um, I, I'm I'm completely uncertain about that, but there is a chance that miniaturizing transaction experiment will also provide you with a better sensitivity to capital. I mean, you're always counteracting the fact that you get a better signal to noise, get, get a better signal to noise when you increase the mass. Right? So in that case, you, in that sense, you lose, of course. So you lose with respect to the um, to, to Avogadro's number, if you want, but you win um, compared to all the noise sources that exist so far in the experiment. So that's okay. Um, so here's our here's the here's the ultimate experiment, and I told you Witten has asked this question um, or prevents us from coming back to the experiment, and now let's put some numbers. Um, so you can do the, the following calculation. You can take now instead of one lead sphere, you take two lead spheres. So exactly um, uh, um, separated. Um, Okay, um, so you, you, you have two LED spheres, you prepare the one LED sphere in a superposition. So two, two LED spheres, 500 microns, initial superposition, um, 500 nanometer. And uh, then you have a second sphere, you prepare it in a motion ground state, and um, just sit and wait. And then you can go back on the envelope calculation, you can ask yourself, so how, uh, how long does it take until those two become entangled? In the, um, in, the, in, the, in the position degree of freedom. And um, this is actually the rate that you can calculate. I mean, if you're interested, I can do that on a blackboard, um, either in a break or whenever. This is like going to take five or ten minutes. It's really two simple calculations, and then um, this is what happens. And this is here, this goes back to Keith's question. So uh, this is very similar to actually Penrose's, um, Penrose's um, uh, numbers. You have this capital G times mass over H bar. This is exactly the prefactor that Penrose also has. But then you also have some uh, geometrical factors of the, of the geometry. So this would be a way, I think, and also to distinguish um, those, uh, those effects from one another. And if you put the numbers, um, then basically you could do that on a, on a, on a second. Because this doesn't have, this is good in that it doesn't have the ambiguity of, of in the Penrose thing, you have this ambiguity of how the mass is distributed in the right. crystal, right? You don't know, is it the center yeah. mass of this entire yeah. object, yeah. or is it the point? Exactly. No, no. This is this is clear. Yeah, that's clear. Yeah. You pre-assume um, just conventional um, Newtonian gravity. You put the take the center of mass um, and put all the mass in. Mm. Yes. So uh, actually, the sort of gives me like what stage you're actually preparing. Oh. Yeah. This blue thing. So, um, so here's x, okay, um, and you start out with, with two objects, right? So here's here's one sphere, here's another sphere, okay? So mass one and mass two. Okay? Now um, the next thing you do is, and here's time, let's say, okay? The next thing you do is you prepare this one in a superposition of two center of mass dead, right? So basically. This one is now uh, like this plus this. Okay, so you, this is now. Uh, then, if this was a state, uh, let's say um, x one of mass one, here's the state um, x. Uh, uh, let's say x zero um, of mass two. Then this is now superposition x one plus x two. Okay, uh, and this one is still just your. This one is still just your, your system here, right? And now uh, you let them further advance. And so basically if you plot the real part of the, of the, of the, um, of the, of the wave function, then um, you would get here, of course, something like that, right? And here just your, your, your ground state wave packet, okay? 
And now you let it fall. So first of all, what happens, you get dispersion in the wave packet, right? And secondly, what happens, you get gravitational interaction. In the gravitational interaction, this one, so this branch uh, here in the superposition, um, so that means that um, you, you, what you calculate now is, let's say you just look at here, the, you just look at here at this, at the x of, um, of, your, of your mass 2, right? So you ask another question, um, how does x of mass 2 involve in time? Um, let's say, first of all, you do that for branch 1, right? So branch 1 is, uh, let's say, that one, right? And then you, then you look at um, x m2 for branch 2, And then you make the difference, and then you ask, what is the delta x um, of m2 as a function of time? And if this is larger than the than the width here, uh, your, your your width um, of m2 at a certain time, uh, then you're in okay. okay? Because then basically you created. Um, so the dip, uh, basically um, the difference now, um, so the, 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 two, the two possible states of M2 are also now distinguishable, and that means that the state here is really, that you, that you in that case, the state that you generate is really um, x1, m1, x1 um, dash m2 plus x2, m1, um, x2 dash m2. Right? That's an entangled state. Okay. And, if, and if you put in the numbers, again, so this is, this is an easy back on the envelope calculation to calculate that one, calculate that one, and then you get the decoherence rate that is exactly there. Okay, and is it obvious that this is an easy thing to measure? So you could measure <laughs> No, no, not at all. So, I mean, another thing you could think about is, like, say, making the F2 extremely heavy, so such that it's just like a static potential. Yeah, yeah, but the problem, if, if that is extremely heavy, um, the, huh? <laughs> well, the, so the, the distance becomes extremely large, for example. Okay. Yeah, but I mean, you could be in a situation where you basically like imprint different phases on x1, m1, and x2, m2. Right? I mean, you can like just look at sort of dephasing, which means that, like, because if that's the position of, of one, the test has to be yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Instead of, instead of measuring the correlations, you could also just look at the, look at the decoherence of your, um, of your system here. Is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah, I was thinking about the phase. Okay. If M2 is much, if just M2 just provides like a lot of potential, it would, it would be phased into. Just for the difference in energy yeah. of the two, the two pieces of the superposition. Yeah. Right. yeah. But you can do the calculation there. Yeah. So this, this is on a time scale much longer. I don't have the, actually, I don't have the slides there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But we, we can do the calculation. So the time scale, this is a time scale that is also made with larger than that one. The defacing. Why is the defacing so slow? Well, if, if you if you take um, if you take um, Earth's gravitation, oh, and so oh, I just can't okay. that's right. I was thinking of all the other sources of defacing. Like, so in, in this universe, there are no other sources. Okay, that's what I thought. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about like I'm faintly remembering that large objects bend space time. Is that? Since you have small numbers here, I don't know, that's not a factor in it. You should check it out. Um, I mean, eventually, of course. Um, let me, um, maybe, okay, what I wanted to do now, and I guess we do that then tomorrow, I, so I wanted to give you a little bit of overview where do we stand in Microsoft quantum physics. So give you a couple of examples, um, where we are, what is current state of the art, and so on. And, um, and then also uh, experiments at the interface between quantum physics and gravity. But maybe since I'm running, I guess we stop now. Huh? So let me just uh, show you one thing because the question came up now. Wait, wait, wait. Seconds. There you go. So. Um, so let, let's put that in a larger context. Okay. So 
at the end of the day, experiments in the index between quantities and gravity always sort of circle around this question. Uh, so does gravity need to be quantized? How much can we actually provide from the experimental side um, to this question of um, quantization of gravity? Okay, so there are a couple of different possibilities how to answer it. Yes? So, standard answer, yes. This is a fundamental field, so there has to be a fundamental quantum field theory for that. Okay, you just need to do it. Okay, very fundamental, just do it. Uh, and it turns out a weak field limit. So basically, um, very far away from black holes. So um, in regions of space where space is almost flat, you can easily quantize the gravitational field. Right? Um, and you can even calculate um, the coherence through the very fact that you do have a gravitationally induced thermal background. Yeah? So that's just shot noise of the gravitational field. And there's a beautiful paper by Miles Blanco, actually it's just, uh, just, uh, just a year old in PL, where he does exactly that. So he says, okay, let's just uh, take standard uh, quantum field theory, the gravitational field, um, and then ask the question, um, what happens if I, in such a case, prepare a coherent superposition of two energy eigenstates? Okay, and then you can write down um, you can write down the decoherence of that uh, of that state. There's a decoherence rate due to coupling to the um, shot noise background, so the thermal noise uh, background of the radiation field. Um, and this is super super weak. Okay, there is decoherence, so this is a standard result from quantum field theory, the gravitational field. Because the temperature of our universe is not zero, there is decoherence. Every superposition um, uh, of, um, of, of states with different um, uh, uh, energy momentum tensors, so like superposition of two energy uh, eigenstates, um, will decohere. But the rates are super small. There's no way, so if you, if you look at Miles paper, there's no way um, to find a method how to generate uh, such a state to see a, a decent decoherence rate. Um, on the other hand, of course, now this is what Keith pointed out, you can ask, are there consequences um, somewhere at the low energy scale? So quantum gravity is, some, is, a, is, a, is a quantum field theory that provides um, uh, uh, um, uh, predictions of um, um, for, for extremely high energies, at the energy of the Planck scale. This is where things happen, this is where you create gravitons and so on. You won't be able to build an accelerator that creates gravitons. But you can ask the question, well, um, if you take this specific theory of quantum gravity series, are there consequences of this theory at the low energy scale? Okay? Uh, people have done that um, for uh, things like uh, supersymmetry. You can do beautiful tabletop atomic physics experiments to test for consequences of supersymmetric theories um, and put some bounds on supersymmetric theories in tabletop experiments. Um, Igor Pikovsky in Vienna um, uh, came up with a beautiful idea, so this was in, in collaboration with Chester Bruckner and my group, um, how to look at consequences of quantum fields of gravity that modify the, the Heisenberg uncertainty relation. And I will talk about that tomorrow. Um, so point is, um, you can look so you cannot look at decoherence for the standard quantum field theories of gravity, but you can look at other low energy effects. So there is a chance that you um, experimentally can have a handle on that. Okay, so this is the one side. What is the other answer? Yes, of course, gravity needs to be quantized um, because gravity is fundamental. So just do it. But the weak field limit is not trivial. So there are people around who uh, say, um, oh, if you do approaches like Blanco do, or like basically 90% of the quantum field theory community does, maybe 99%, um, you're not allowed to do that. Because we know that um, gravity, uh, quantum field theory gravity, is not renormalizable. It just doesn't work. We know that. Um, which means that per perturbative approaches to a, to a quantum field do not work in principle. Right? So this approach is simply blatantly wrong. You are not allowed to do that. If you want to quantize gravity, you need to have some path integral approach or so, so some things that basically are not perturbative. You need to do a non-perturbative approach. 
um, string theory would be such an example. Um, and then there was recently there was a paper by Unruh and Gooding. So Bill Unruh is one of the proponents of the, the weak field limit being non-trivial. Um, and they cast out some claims saying, um, oh, if you do it right, there will be decoherence, but the decoherence is always magnitude larger than what you would expect from standard quantum field theory. Okay? This is a interesting, but I don't know what to say about it. <laughs> uh, okay, then is number three. Does gravity need to be quantized? No. Why? Yeah, because gravity is fundamental. <laughs> <laughs> and it's fundamental to the extent um, that um, it's, it's fundamental to the extent that we are not allowed to fiddle around with it. Okay? Mm -hmm. you're, not, you're not allowed to apply quantum theory to it. Because it is the very basis on which you build quantum theory. Because it provides you with space and time. So any other theory of nature builds upon gravity. That's why you're not allowed to uh, touch it. Yeah? It's just it's untouchable. <laughs> it's like God given. Um, and this is essentially these approaches by Penrose, Diyoshi, Curly Hasi, and so on. And if you, if you stick to that, if you basically say, oh look, all other fields in nature are quantum, but gravity is not, then in order to describe an experiment at the interface between quantum physics and gravity, you need some sort of semi-classical approach. Okay? There's a huge history of semi-classical approaches in quantum optics. This would be worth a lecture in itself, um, where it's beautifully shown that these approaches just fail. Okay? I mean, this is, essentially, this is old stuff. People have tried it in the 50s and 60s in quantum optics, even in the 20s. I mean, Bohr rejected Einstein's 1905 paper on the, on the quantum uh, light quantum hypothesis. He said, this cannot be dropped, this cannot be true. Matter needs to be quantized, light must not be quantized. And he, he rejected that. It took until the, um, the Compton effect, which was 15 years later, 18 years later, until the Compton effect that Bohr accepted that, um, that Einstein was right. And so, this is the background of the bohr kramer slater theory, BKS. So this, this was cast out to show that you can explain the Compton effect without having to quantize the electron. Okay, anyway, and in that case, the coherence is also very strong, and then you could actually measure that. Okay, now, now, now I have to stop. What exactly are they tracing out to get the decoherence in these field theories? Where? Where? Here? Yeah. Um, well, in that case, you do not really need to trace out, so it's a, um, if you want, so this is essentially defacing now. Right? Um, basically, um, you couple to a gravitational background. I mean, if, you, if you trace out the, the, the gravitational, um, the gravitational uh, environment. So the fact that um, you have a thermal reservoir. Right. Okay. Uh, to, to measure and prove or disprove the strong theories, they can't just measure the theories? Yeah, the, the, these well, ones? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. That's, that's the point. So this, this I, will, I will show you tomorrow. I will show you a couple of numbers that these people come up with. And my claim is that um, with those devices that we are heading towards, massive systems in superposition states with long coherence times, that in such devices, one will be able to basically yes. kill this uh, this side. Okay. So, so, so this is actually a very interesting last statement mm -hmm. yeah, because it's the only statement that they disagree with. Yeah, I know, I know. No, but we, 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 I know. I know. <laughs> no, 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 the point is that, that the experiments will tell you which ones to eliminate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. cannot say a priori which ones you really need. Uh, my, my claim is that the, the, the predictions are so strong that um, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a big cut. So basically, you just kill one of them. Or, or the other side. Uh, on this side, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, or the other side. Yeah. <laughs> on the other side. Yeah. That's my point. No, no, yeah. yeah. No, I, I, said, I said it deliberately. You know, coming from Vienna, I know, of course, very well um, Popper's, um, yeah. Popper's rules and so on. So when, when I say kill, I mean kill. <laughs> <laughs> they say kill. Yeah, the process. Yeah, let's thank uh, Marcus. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, 
but in the interest of space time, <laughs> we will take a short break. We will come back here, and I think you will have time to decide which side of this uh, vertical line you belong to. Yeah, so and, yeah and, and there's a right side. There is. <laughs> <laughs> so, we will come back in five, five minutes. Uh, yeah, yeah.